My name is Sandra, and I'm an alcoholic, um, and I have the potential to be addicted to anything. Um, I come to AA um, in 2001 was probably my first AA meeting, and I didn't want to be here. Um, I was young, and I think the courts probably sent me, but um, I've been here since then, I think, and um, I'll share my experience, strength, and hope, um, starting with some of my experience. Uh, I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. Um, I was born to a very dysfunctional family. Both my parents had alcohol and drug addiction as well. And um, they split up when I was six months old, so all my life I was blamed for that. Um, had a very rocky start. Just the first 10, 12 years of my life was really difficult. Um, Dad took us on all his drinking vendors, and we had a lot of near-death experiences from his um, drinking and partying and bringing two kids along with him. So um, any sense that I have probably came from my grandparents that were trying to help raise me. Um, I was raised in, in church, um, and I, I choose to call my higher power God. Um, but for a long time, I felt like I had walked too far away from him or I had done too many things to, to reach out. So um, my first drink um, was when I was eight years old. <laughs> I picked a beer up off the table and tried it, and it had cigarette butts in it. It was totally disgusting, um, but I still got a little buzz off of it, and everybody paid me attention. Um and they laughed at me and, you know, I was used to not having attention because they were all drunk and having their own time. So whenever um, I drank, I acted silly and got attention and that kind of perked my interest. Um, it was probably when I was 12 that I started regularly drinking. Um, my dad's house was the place you don't want your kids to go, the place you always warn your kids about. Um, every weekend um, we would have several bottles of like Boone's Farm Strawberry Hill, but we didn't drink it like you drink wine. We drank it like you would play in quarters um, with liquor um, and took shots and guzzled. And um, so I can I can see very early on that my drinking was never healthy. Um, I don't know if there's such thing as healthy drinking. I guess there's some controlled drinking out there, but not for alcoholics or not for this alcoholic. Um, so, you know, it started pretty heavily. Um, and, and I can remember feeling free when I drank or feeling numb. I didn't have to deal with things. Um, I didn't feel like it was my fault my parents split up. Um, I didn't have to deal with uh, the physical and emotional abuse that I'd been through. Um, Dad would, would beat the snot. I mean, like, not whoopings. I believe in, in corporal punishment. A kid needs a spanking if they need a spanking. But I have scars um, from the spankings I endured with him. Um and, you know, I just felt like I wasn't good enough, um, and I never would be. Um, there were um, several different times where I went through um, sexual abuse from some of Daddy's um, friends that were over drinking and things like that. And um, I always thought it was my fault um, that I, I don't know, I just felt like, I, you know, I did something wrong. I, I made a mistake, and I was being punished. Um, but when I drank, I didn't feel that. When I when I drank, I didn't um, worry about what was going to happen when Dad got home and he started drinking again. I didn't worry about the spankings and stuff. I just felt free. Um, it was all temporary. You know, it was the hang, hangover started um, probably 13, 14 years old um, because I got to where I would drink until I passed out or till there was no more and I could get no more. It wasn't just a, a fun hangout anymore. Um, so that was, you know, things started, I, I want to think between 13 and 14 things in my life really started going downhill. Um, I didn't have a lot of guidance, like I said, and, um, the drinking was starting to take over. So I found out at 14 that I was pregnant with my first child. Um, he is now 26 years old, and um, I was lost and scared and, and really had nobody. Um, Mom really wasn't there for me, so I pretty much have been on my own since I was 14. 
um, I was four months in the ninth grade and quit because people made fun of me uh, because I was pregnant. You know, I was the town whore um, because I was so young and, and pregnant. And so I just, you know, I just kind of, I didn't drink while I was pregnant. I feel like I switched uh, to the like other addictive behaviors that I have. I, I think I was still in things at that time, and that was kind of like my adrenaline rush. Um, I mean, even like things I didn't need, I'd have money in my pocket. But when I went in the store, I'd still pack a gum. I mean, it was just ridiculous type stuff. Um, but it was whatever was feeding my my addiction at that time uh, because I was pregnant. But shortly after he was born, I started drinking again. Um, that was 15, and that's when I got my first legal charge. And I, I can sit here and look back now and tell at 15 I was a true blue alcoholic. Um, I had started going to the clubs and hanging out with friends, and I had a fake ID made that said I was 18, and, you know, I could get in the clubs. I had to hide to drink and things like that, but uh, that wasn't good enough for me. I felt like I had to go get uh, ID at size 21 so I could buy my own liquor, and I didn't have to hide under the table to drink or whatever it was. So um, I went uh, – uh, one of my sister's friends let me use her birth certificate and stuff. And I went to the DMV and got a fake ID made that said I was 21 years old. And of course, you know, during the the actual getting it done, I mean, I was able to get the ID and able to leave. Uh, but two weeks later, investigators came to the house and um, I got charged with uh, obtaining property by false pretense and false identification or something like that. So here I am, uh, 15 years old, and my my criminal background has started. Um, so after that, I just really feel like um, I, I, it went from weekend drinking to uh, every other day drinking maybe. Um, I, I just couldn't function much. I tried to be a mom uh, to my son and, you know, other things got involved. Um, Dad smoked marijuana with me when I was 12 years old and I would do that occasionally, but it wasn't really something um that I did a whole lot. Um, I remember being uh, 15 years old and mom um, gave me some methamphetamine and cocaine. And um, I didn't really care for those at that time, but the, between the alcohol and cocaine, it's ended up that those ended up being my worst enemies that um, brought me to the pits of hell. That's all I, I know to say. Um, so the next couple of years, um, were jails institutions and I believe there would have been death um I had lost jobs and been homeless and um just you know trying to make it and I'm not sure why my child didn't get taken before but um at 17 I had my daughter um she's now 23 and um here I am a single mom with two kids their father was very abusive physically emotionally mentally uh, so we weren't together. Um, he never paid child support or tried to help me with the kids. I just, um, I don't even know how I survived. I remember having a job one time at McDonald's, but other than that, I, I didn't really work. Um, I stayed from place to place. Um, so I had, I guess at 19 is when um, I had been introduced to AA. Um, social services had been called because um of my drinking and um, I think the incident that happened, I think I was passed out on the couch and my son, um, three, three, no, was he three and a half, four years old, decided that he was going to go outside and ride his electric fire truck down the dr gravel driveway beside, that was a drive, it was a gravel road beside the house and um, he uh, put it in the ditch. So, and I was asleep. Um, somebody come knocking on the door and brought him back to me and and I think um, my higher power that he watched over him I don't know what would have happened but at that time I tried to to get sober I tried to quit drinking on my own um, I tried to go to church and stay away from people um, I got a job um, I, I thought things were were going okay you know but I didn't admit that I was an alcoholic I didn't admit that I had a problem because I just I was able to quit for a little while, you know, I, I think I'd been quit for two months and I was able to get my own apartment and, um, you know, I jumped through the hoops for, for social services. I went to the meetings they told me to, to go to and I thought everybody at the meeting was absolutely nuts because they were smiling and laughing and they weren't drinking and um, they had to be on something else. That's, that's what I thought when I first come in and, 
you know, there was there was one lady that was there. Um, her name was Candy, um, and she became my first sponsor. Um, you know, at the time I wasn't ready for that, but she um, kind of took me under her wing and you know told me the the do's and don'ts and suggestions that we all hear. Um, you know, I started learning things. You know, just things that we say in the program, like easy does it or life on life's terms and things like that. And they stuck in my head. Um, but I, I went back out. I think I had probably about 11 months clean, but I didn't commit to a program or anything like that. Um, so when I relapsed, um, it was an old friend. You know, it, the program suggests that you change all people, places and things. Um, and your playgrounds um, that you used to be around if you drink or they trigger you. Um, and I didn't do that. So I had, you know, kept friends that I shouldn't have. And they said, I was doing so good and I deserved a party. So we went over and, and drank and it started um, my last um, and hopefully final um, drinking binge that lasted for about two years. Um, both my children um, were taken from me about three months into that drinking. Um, I lost my job. I lost my car. I lost the apartment and the kids went to live with my grandparents and I was just out of control. Um, I was drinking every day, um, using whatever kind of drugs I could get my hands on. And, um, I, I was homeless. I didn't have anywhere to go. Um, I had burnt bridges at home. My grandparents wouldn't let me come around because I couldn't stay sober enough. And my kids were there sober long enough to, to be there. And when they did invite me over, I remember just sleeping on the couch and my daughter trying to wake me and me not being able to, to wake up and things like that. Um, so it was really um, absent as a parent for those two years. Um, during that time, I got multiple legal charges, um, like paraphernalia charges. I got a DUI, um, and I think it was it was I got out of that first DUI, um, but you know it was just the things that were happening to me in my life. Instead of them being red flags for me or things for me to change or straighten up my life, they were. Um, it's just like they just forced me more into the bottle, uh, more into my oblivious. Uh, my numbness um, that alcohol provided for me. Um, so that went on, like I said, for about two years. Um, and I can remember the last three months that I was out there. Um, I was running from the police. I had failure to appear uh, for multiple charges that I had. I had a probation violation. And, um, you know, I was just drinking it and, and I looked horrible. I was probably 98 pounds. You could see every bone in my body. My eyes were sunk back in my head. Half the teeth in my mouth were either rotten or gone. And I hated me. And when I looked in the mirror, I did not know who that was that was staring back at me. That wasn't um, Sandra. Um, and, and I can remember looking in the mirror and saying, who the hell are you? And what did you do with Sandra? And um, that was one of the the last drinks that I had um and I and woke up two days later in jail that was April um the 26th of 2003 so my sobriety day is April the 28th of 2003 because I had um used while I was in in jail the the, the first day, the second day that I woke up the 27th so I wanted I use the 28th because it's my first full day without drugs or alcohol. Um, and I believe in, in complete abstinence. Um, I, I've, my addictive behaviors are so bad that I, I can get addicted to, to people, places. I mean, you know, just, just about anything. Um, so I really started going, um, you know, in, in jail. I was there for about three months. Um, actually, I was sent to prison um, for three months because of the probation violations and you know when I was there I was in a different place um I had never been in jail and not been able to get out or you know somebody could bond me out or maybe it was just two weeks I mean this was uh four months three months three and a half four months away from all the people places and things I'd ever known I was by myself and I was forced to to sit still and listen to God um and I honestly feel like 
uh, my higher power, which I choose to call God, picked me up out of the pits of hell and, and placed me in prison. Um, and, and that's my freedom, you know, that, that freed me from alcohol and drugs. Um, so I haven't had to have a drink or a drug since April uh, the 28th of 2003. Um, so in, in prison, I started going to meetings and I was going to some church services in there. And, you know, I had always thought that, um, you know, I, I was a good person or I could do things the right way. And um, I had a lady that was serving a life sentence talk to me one day and she said, um, she asked me uh, if I believed in God or not. And I told her I did. Um, and she looked at me and she said, uh, well, why do you think you're better than God? And I didn't feel like I was better than God. I mean, that was my higher power. That was my creator. And, you know, I had been raised um, differently. I just felt like I wasn't good enough for him. And she, whenever I said that, I said, I don't think I'm better than him. She said, well, then who are you not to forgive yourself and not to forgive others that trespass against you because he can forgive anybody for anything and he loves you right where you are. Um, and that really was the light bulb that started in my head. You know, I, I started going to more meetings. Anytime I thought about one of the things that I had done in my in my active drinking days, uh, whether it was lying, stealing, waking up in somebody's bed, didn't know how I got there, um, different things like that, I would ask God to forgive me and I would um, – Ask God to help me forgive myself because that was one of the problems. Um, you know, alcohol and drugs were but a symptom. I'm the problem. Um, inside Sandra's head is the problem. I'm the sick one that needs help. And um, so I started actually working on me and looking at me, which is one of the hardest things I think that I've ever done um, is to to face reality and take responsibility um, but coming to the, the meetings in the program, um, like I said, I got a sponsor um, and me and her started working the steps together. Um, so the first three steps, I still work every day. Um, uh, I, I have to admit that I'm an alcoholic every day. I have to um, surrender every day. So I, I look at the first three steps as I can't, he can, I'm going to let him. Um, and, and that really is the thoughts that go through my mind when I wake up because um, I just I need to to remember where I came from. Um, I was in the program for about a year and a half before I was willing to do my four step. Um, but I had been working on it, writing down things and, you know, doing that four step really healed me in a lot of ways. It just um, it gave me some clarity on what my responsibility were, was with my um, actions. You know, it's like my sponsor had me write down whatever the um, resentment was, who the person was, what their part was and what my part was. And the big thing that I learned is I have no control over what they did or why they did it. Uh, but I have control over how I let it affect me today and how I let it um how I let it affect my life. You know, if I get angry or if I get mad or if I'm upset um, about it, you know, I have to work through those things. And a lot of things that I blamed myself for, whether that was uh, being sexually abused as a child or it was, you know, it was my fault. I got the, the abuse from my father. Come on, Sebastian. Sorry. This is my fat boy. Um, and uh, I, I started realizing, you know, that that it wasn't all me and that I could forgive me and I could move on. So, you know, in the program, I've learned that I'm responsible for my side of the street um, and keeping it clean. I can't control what other people, places and things do. And um, through the program, I've begun to have serenity and peace um, through working the steps, you know, and, and being able to make amends to people and um you know, one of the things that I heard when I first came in the program that I thought was really crazy is to keep what you have, you have to give it away. And it didn't make sense to me. You know, how can you keep something if you're giving it away? But it, it's the service work. It's the attending meetings, you know, come early, stay late, uh, go to the functions, uh, get involved, sponsor people. Um, as I've sponsored people over the years, it's it's been uh, probably more beneficial to me than it has them. 
Um, you know, I think the first couple people I sponsored, I thought that I had to fix them. I had to save them. And, you know, I, I have no control over that. All I can do is give people recommendations from the program and tell them how I got sober and, and what worked for me. Um, now, the steps work if you work them and, and the program works. Uh, but everybody has a little bit of a different story and need a little bit of a different approach. That's why you go to the meetings and you uh, – I was told, you know, just pick pick somebody around the table that had what you wanted and ask them to be your sponsor, and, and that's kind of um, how things went. Um, but, you know, as, as I shared my experience, Strength and Hope, or as I worked through the steps with people, it, it helped me um, stay sober one day at a time. Uh, there's been times that I haven't been able to go to meetings like I should or like I want to and staying in touch with those people on a constant daily basis has, has helped me get through. Um, now over the last, I don't know, 10 years since I've moved to Tennessee, I've had some times where I didn't go to meetings like I should. And, and I can tell you when I don't go to meetings, my serenity and my peace are gone. Um, I've, thankfully not had to have a drink or a drug um like I said but I feel like I've been in the the process of relapse several times you know it doesn't start when you first pick up you start stop going to meetings and you start thinking that you have control over things and uh, then you get upset about something you start putting yourself in situations uh where you're exposed to things and it's easy access and um, you know, I think I've went through that cycle a couple times and I've been able to stop the cycle and get out of it by going back to meetings or reworking my steps, um, sharing, uh, just, you know, with people. One of the other things, the sayings that we have that I really like is um, that you're as sick as your secrets. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, I. I, if I think about a, a alcoholic drink or a drug, I tell somebody, I tell my sponsor, I tell my husband, um, because if I don't, that little thought grows and it, it changes. And just for instance, when I was drinking, um, Smirnoff Ice had come out and it was just the plain ones. They didn't have all these flavors and stuff. And I can remember when they started coming out with the flavors, I was mad. I was mad because they had these flavors and I couldn't try the peach and I couldn't try the grape. And, I mean, it was stupid. I didn't want to drink, but I was mad that they weren't there when I was drinking. So I shared about it at a meeting, you know. And, you know, I'm not the only person um, that that feels that way or that has thoughts like that. And that, that helps me, you know, to know that, you know, I'm an alcoholic. I'm always going to be an alcoholic. Uh, working the steps and working my program is what keeps, um, you know, keeps the program uh, in the front of my mind and keeps me on track. But, when somebody walks by with alcohol, I smell it. You know, when a, a commercial comes on, you can hear, well, it, there's no, not commercials like there used to be, but you would, would hear it and you, you would picture which beverage it was in your head. Um, so, you know, it was just a, I beat myself up about that and, and felt like I was unconsciously craving because I thought things like that. But like I said, sharing at meetings um, and, People told me, and I would have these nightmares, um, dreams about using, I mean, like so much so, like I would wake up and feel nauseated, like I had a hangover or I was drunk and um, I would be in a panic and be scared. And uh, then I'd look around and realize that I was in my home and um, my kids were here and, and everything was was OK. Um, but I, I shared that at a meeting and somebody told me that God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself through those dreams through those experiences because if I if I went back out this was the consequences that was the feeling I was going to have and I never want to forget um I never want to forget that last drunk that I had and the pain uh, that it cost me I don't beat myself up about it anymore um several of, of the things that I did um I still think about or I use them in my um in my story or when I'm, I'm talking to people um, just because, you know, all of us have a different bottom. Um, I feel like uh, my bottom, I kept digging and digging. I almost got to the lava in the middle of the earth or whatever. Um, but, you know, I, I thank um, God for this program and, and I thank God that, um, that somebody uh, cared enough about me to, to love me when I didn't love myself uh, because there was a time that, you know, I, I didn't, 
love me and I love me today. I'm not uh, where I want to be, but I'm surely not what I used to be. Um, so I had, um, like I said, I had gotten sober and started working the program. And within about six months of sobriety, I had gotten my children back. I had my own place to live and I had gotten a car. Um, you know, it was it was starting to live life and, and living life on life's terms was hard. Um, being a single mom was hard. Um, finding jobs was hard for me um, it's still hard for me in a way because I do have a criminal background record. Um, and you know, it, it, I can't change it. Um, and I've told people, you know, there, I wouldn't change it because it's what saved my life without that, um, stint in prison. I don't, I don't think I would be alive today. I think I would be dead. Um, and, and some people that I associated with through the years, um, are dead because of addiction. And, and that's one of my major goals is to die, die sober, um, when it's time. Um, let's see. This, like I said, the steps have been really helpful for me. Um, and going to meetings and seeing the same faces, you know, hearing hearing things over and over again, um, and how other people deal with them. You know, we say we have a toolbox in in AA, and and you've got to use the tools. You know, the tools are your steps. The tools are some of the sayings. Learn what your triggers are. You know, if if driving down Elm Street um, is the liquor store that you used to go to. Take extra five minutes and drive the other way if it's a, if it's something that bothers you. You know when you and and that was the first four or five years it was like that. You know I couldn't um, I couldn't drive uh, around areas that I used to party. I didn't trust myself. I, I felt unstable. So you know that that change in the people, places, and things was really a good good thing for me. I want to think about it. two years into. Uh, recovery and going to meetings um you know I, I needed a little bit of everything I needed my meetings um I needed to go to church that was something that was part of my life I was probably sober for about a year before I prayed uh, to to God as I understand him um or really got back into church because I felt like I wasn't enough or I had why would he want to use me you know I've, I'm I'm horrible um but uh when I started going back, there was a freedom that I felt inside of me. And, and I realized that through my drinking, through my using, my higher power was with me the whole time. He never left me. I just ignored him. And I just kept running from him because there's so many times that I should have been dead. Uh, so many times that I shouldn't have woke up or that I drove after drinking that it could have ended terribly. Um so, it's, you know, I needed my church family and then I needed my um, I needed my therapist. I went to a therapist for like reintegration therapy with my kids and that was really helpful to me. But it wasn't like, you know, people say therapy. Oh, you're sitting on a couch, just psychotherapy. It wasn't like that. I mean, this this reintegration therapy actually taught me how to live life. Like he taught me how to balance a checkbook he taught me what a consumer report was he taught me how to handle different situations with my kids because I didn't get that growing up you know my parents didn't teach me right from wrong and um, they're the ones that I used with so that first two years I was in recovery I didn't speak to either one of them and I didn't see them um, because they were you know they were part of the um I guess accessibility part of the people, places, and things that I've partied with. So, I um, I just stayed away from them, and, and that was hard. You know, I hear people sometimes say, "Well, these people are my friends," or "These this is all I've known my whole life," and you know, it, it is all you've known, but they're not true friends. Um, and you know, you call them at two o'clock in the morning unless you've got money or alcohol or something, they're not going to come get you. But, you know, the, the people that I've met in the program are true friends. Like I could call any of them with a flat tire and, and they'd come help. And, and it wouldn't matter what time of day or not, you know, I can um, pick the phone up and call my sponsor or um, just call one of the people and, and they're there for me. You know, I, I never knew what a true friend um, was until I um, came to AA. Um, and started meeting uh, people that were in re that were in recovery, you know, and, and there's people that are going to come like when I first started coming that are there to have a paper signed. And, you know, that's OK. Um, 
I heard things that stuck in my head um, from when I was there getting my paper signed and wasn't serious. So, um, you know, I just share my experience, strength and hope. And um, I, I leave what um, I don't need at the meetings and I take when I can. You know, uh, there's some things you, you'll hear people talk and it'll make you cringe or they'll get on your nerves. And there's this one one certain guy that he always talked and he would say at the end of the meeting he when there was any announcements he'd say AA's good and it just made me sick I, was, I don't know why he never done anything to me he was a nice guy well he moved away and now like you know it's been I don't know four or five years ago and I learned so much from him you know I mean like even though I, I didn't and, and maybe he had a lot of my characteristics or something maybe I saw my behaviors in him I'm not sure but now at the end of the meeting most of the time when they ask for a, is there any AA related announcements I'll say AA is good um, because it is you know it changed my life um, it gave me my life back and um, so I I've talked about you know the experiences that I went through um, Everybody has a story, whether they're war stories or, you know, um, the dysfunctional family, um, just the, the different things that we go through. Um, and, you know, some of my hope is uh, just what the program has done for me. And, or I'd say the strength is what my program's done for me. You know, it's gave me uh, the ability to wake up in the morning and stay sober. It's given me the ability to um, call for help you know that phone weighs 3,000 pounds when you when you really need it um, so I was told to call somebody every day whether I needed to or not and it would be a lot easier to pick the phone up when it was when I was having a bad time or when I wanted to pick up a drink um, so a lot of the the things in the program have, have been real helpful for me um, I, I seriously I think I would be dead without them but about um i guess it was about two years in the program um my my dreams come true about being in health care from the time i was a little girl i used to want to be a nurse and um, or work in health care uh, i wanted to uh, take care of my grandmother she'd say i was going to grow up and be her little nurse and take care of her and uh you know through my drinking through my behaviors through my criminal behavior activity and uh, the the record that I had I never thought that I would have that um, and the program restored that for me um, somebody asked me to work at the assisted living facility so I worked there uh, for several years as a CNA and a med tech uh, ended up working my way up to management position there um, and and I was loving life you know I was going to meetings three four times a week um, I had my children um, my little brother is 20 years younger than me had gotten taken from mom and was in foster care um, and through uh, the steps and, and what this program's done for me i was able to get him out of foster care and i i've raised him for i've raised him for a little over 14 years um and you know i was able to to give him a little bit better uh, foundation than what i had um so you know i am um, I think I was about five or six years in recovery. I met my husband and moved to Tennessee. So I live in, in Greenville, Tennessee now and um, started going to, to the meetings around here. And um, one of the first meetings I went to, I met my sponsor, uh, or she's my sponsor now. She wasn't for a long time, but she was at one of the first meetings I went to, and that was in 2007 when I come up here. And uh, meetings here were different. I thought they were different. Like they, they were arranged differently or, you know, they – um, had what was called like a round robin or uh, they would go around the table so sometimes you were kind of pointed out to share and and I feel like that was good for me though because it, it got me more comfortable with sharing and talking about things in the meetings um, and so uh, over the years um, when, well when I moved up here you know I didn't have the educational background but I had the job that I had um, and with my husband and the stability that came with that and financially and emotionally and I'd never really had that like it was a family unit you know it's the first time in my life that I felt like oh wow I have a family and um, you know we took the kids in bed together and things like that and and it was you know I wanted them to have what I didn't I wanted the cycle to be broken um 
I wanted Mm -hmm. them to uh, not go through the things that I went through. And, you know, you can't protect them from everything. But um, I know being sober uh, surely gave them a better life. Um, You know, there's times that it's been hard because my two older children remember me using. They remember me leaving them for two years. And um, the first couple years in recovery, I feel like I was just trying to make up for lost time. But you can't. Um, and me and my sponsor talked about it, and it's like I'm, I'm making a living amends, you know, staying sober one day at a time and being a productive member of society and, and taking care of responsibility to raise my kids was the amends to them. Um, and when they got a little bit older, 13, 14 years old, and they started holding stuff over my head or say, well, you wasn't there or things like that, you know, it was real hurtful. Um, I sit down and I talk to them and I told them, you know, I, I made amends for them. To, I made amends to them. I talked to them. I said, you know, I can't change it, um, and and but you're not going to hold me hostage in this anymore. Um, and you know, there was freedom after that. So now, if they if they do say something about the past, I just say I, I'm not in bondage over that anymore, or something like that. And they will be quiet about it. But um, they're both um, the two older children are grown and and are being successful. Uh, they haven't been successful all the time um i ended up uh, kicking both of them out um at ages of 19 and 18 uh, because they brought either alcohol into my home or um quit going to uh, quit going to college or something like that and refused to get a job and help pay bills um and that was probably some of the hardest times you know just letting them go and making them uh, figure it out on their own but it was probably the best decision they ever made for them because like I said both were doing good my Austin is 26 and he's in the Air Force he's stationed in Glendale Arizona and doing great Um, and my daughter's 23 she's got her degree in early childhood education and uh, watches children um I have a, a son that's 14 um, with my husband, um, and he actually started high school today. So when I dropped him off at high school this morning, I felt I felt it, uh, you know, just getting a little bit older. But you know what? I could drop him off at high school. I wasn't drunk. You know, I didn't wake up with a hangover this morning, and it's because of the program. Um, it's because of, of living um, life on life terms with the program. So, um, you know, I started, I, I went back to school in 2010 and started trying to, um, Maestro started trying to um, make my dream as a nurse come true. And I had a lot of obstacles, you know, um, I was told by several people that I had no business trying to become a nurse because I was a an alcoholic in recovery and I had a background record and, and I needed to, I needed to choose a different career. Um, and I told, you know, I really feel like this is what my higher power wants me to do. Um, and I believe if God brings you to it, he'll bring you through it. Um, and I had, had, had the, um, the faith and the support of my AA family. I, I don't know how many times I went into AA and I cried over a test or I cried over going to clinicals or, you know, something. And, and they were there for me uh, to kind of encourage me and push me through because I constantly have this voice in my head that's negative. You know, it's like I, I tell everybody, if you've ever seen the Flintstones where you've got an angel on one side and the devil on the other. I mean, you know, it's not like, you know, I'm hallucinating, but your conscious is what I mean. Um, And, you know, I I believe that people with alcohol and addiction problems, they have two over here. You know, they have their addiction and they have the devil trying to get them to do their own thing. And, and, you know, constantly saying you're not enough, you'll never make it. Those people are better than you or or things like that. And, you know, the program helps me know um, and reminds me that, that I am enough. You know, I am enough just, just the way I am. Um, so in 2012, I graduated um, with my um, associate degree in nursing. Um, I had met my nursing mentor. Her, name's, her name was Kathleen. She um, kind of took me under her wing and, and become a mother to me. Um, but she had pushed me to go ahead and get my bachelor's degree as well. So in 2013, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in nursing and I loved my job. I loved taking care of people. Um, I loved the things uh, that God had allowed me to do and, 
Um, but it was frustrating because, there's, you know, my bosses knew that I was in recovery, but everybody around me didn't. And people would run their mouths about the alcoholics that would come in or they would talk about stuff. And, and it was frustrating. So, I mean, I really feel blessed uh, that I'm in the medical field um, with the knowledge that I have of recovery and addiction, because what the medical field knows and are taught about recovery is wrong. You know, they, they go about it the, the wrong way. They don't. Um, I don't know. Some of the stuff that, 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 that you're taught is not even logical. Um, so, you know, through um, me working um, and with Kathleen's encouragement, um, she wanted me to go back and, and get my master's degree in nursing and um, become a nurse practitioner. Um, and, and there's been a lot of tri- trials and challenges with that, uh, with my background. A lot of things I've had to prove, um, you know, that, that I, that I'm different, that, that this program and my higher power has, have changed who I was, you know, today, if I meet somebody or, or even if I think about like me sitting here right now, thinking about my story and and the things that I did growing up and the life that I lived and how was that me, you know, and, and that wasn't me, you know, that's like I said, um, I, and I'm still getting to know me uh, through the program. Um, and it's, it's one day at a time. Um, so in 2016, um, I graduated um, from um, my master's program and become a nurse practitioner. And the last five years, I've traveled um, as a nurse practitioner, and I've been able to help a lot of people. Um, you know, and, and I've met a lot of uh, people in in different places in in the program. You know, I've uh, been to several meetings on a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean. You know, I would be in Maryland or be in um, South Carolina, and, and I would just look up the local meetings, and I would go um, to the meetings. You know, I was always welcome with open arms. It's like I had a family everywhere, um, and I can I can remember. I'm not sure what the statistics are now, but I can remember um, somebody telling me they were talking about the big book being in over 47 different languages, and I know it's more now. And um, you know, there was over a million members and um, about how many groups there were across the world. And I, I remember just the realization that I'm a part of that. You know, I have a huge family um, that care about me and, and that'll be there for me no matter, no matter where I'm at. So um, it's been um, – it's been a journey, um, and, I, you know, I'm still on my journey. Uh, I believe, like I said, that I will always be an alcoholic. I'll never be able to take another drink, um, and I feel like if I – I know. I don't feel like I know if I take another drink, I'll be dead. Um, so going to meetings is still a part of my life today. Um, you know, I've had a lot of things happen over the last year that have been difficult for me, Um uh, Kathleen, the lady that was my, like my mom, uh, she passed away unexpectedly last year. And then one of my best friends in the program passed away, uh, like not even a month after she did. Um, you know, I've learned, I learned a lot from, from her. Um, her name is Beth and she had 11 months sober when she passed away and me and her fought for that for five years. Uh, but she always kept coming back. You know, I, I don't know, you know, we'd call people that do that a revolving door. Um, but no matter what she did, no matter when she, when, she, how many times she messed up, she just kept coming back. You know, she wouldn't give up. Um, and she had that before she, um, before she left, you know. Um, and I, I'm grateful that I was part of that. Um, but, you know, it, I, I want to think that it, it gave me, or would give me the strength that if something did happen and I went out to come back, you know, um, they keep, they say, you know, keep, keep coming back. It works if you work it, it won't if you don't. And I believe that, um, you know, you can come in and, and hear what everybody says and, and, you know, you get a history lesson. But if you come in and you hear what is said and you take it home with you and you meditate on it and you practice it in your life, then you actually get a life lesson. You know, it adds to your journey. Um, and that's been, that's been good for me. Um, I think I'm getting close to my time. I got 10 minutes left. Um, let's see, what can I tell y'all? Um, so over the last year, 
my husband's currently deployed. He's overseas. And um, without um, some of the people in the program reaching out to me, I, I don't know uh, that I'd be here today. You know, it's, it's been a struggle the last year. And um, I can tell you, you know, if you if you stop going to meetings, I, I think I was a little angry after Beth died or, or something or just stayed away. You know, I didn't go to meetings like I used to. And um, I wasn't working my program and my serenity was gone. You know, it's like for a couple months, I felt like I was in a relapse without using, you know, I didn't pick up a drink. I didn't pick up a drug, but I was completely miserable and I didn't um, have any peace or joy. And um, Glenn, thank God, stays in touch with me and he sends me daily reflections or he sends me the meeting list and, you know, just uh, people and other people in the program, they just reel you back in, you know, I mean, and then that's part of, being able to go to the meetings and associate with other people is, is they get to know you and they can tell when something's going on with you and, and pull you to the side and say, Hey, you, you okay? Something that not seem right. And, and sometimes that helps you talk about the things that you really don't want to talk about. Um, so, you know, I've started going um, to more meetings the last couple of weeks and um, I was at a meeting Tuesday and, Glenn got a message that the speaker today wasn't going to be able to speak, and he asked me if I wanted to speak today, and I was like, okay. So I did, and, and I've signed up to cheer cheer some meetings, but, you know, um, the more you work your program, the more, uh, or the more I work my program, the more um, it's part of my daily life, the more I turn things over to God and allow him to be in control of my life, uh, the more peace I have, the more serenity I have. Um, you know, big things can happen, like like when the deaths happen, um, people come around and they were with me. You know, it's not usually those big things that take you back out. It's the little things that add up, you know, like you stumped your toe. Um, there's a gentleman that comes into the program. I've not seen him in a while, but I call him the Hamburglar because he had been sober for like six months and doing good. And he was out to eat with his mom and the guy messed his hamburger up. And he said that's what triggered him to like that set him off the edge. You know, those other things that added up. Or, or that had been going on, but you know, you've got to you've got to look at at the little things. You know, as sick as your secrets, like I said, uh, tell somebody. You know, even if it's just a little thought. Um, when you when you talk to somebody, it, and you know, sometimes you might not even need to have feedback from them, but when you say the things out loud yourself, and you hear yourself say them, sometimes you work through them on your own. Um, but it, you know, like I said, it's been a journey. I'm grateful for this program. I'm grateful uh, for the friends. Um, and I'm grateful for the life I have today. You know, I, I have um, built a life that I never dreamed of having uh, because of the program. Um, you know, I, I have um, a good relationship with my children today. Um, my dad was able to be sober for three months before he died, and that was all I had all I had in the 36 years that I was alive um, or that, you know, with him. And then mom, she's been sober for 10 years now, and, and she's doing good, but I couldn't force it on them. You know, I tried after that two years just to try to get them to go to meetings and try to get them to do things, and, and you can't. Um, you know, we have family, you know, you, you get so happy you're on that pink cloud and you just want to give it to everybody. And, you know, if we could bottle recovery and, and give it to people, we'd be millionaires. Um, it, but, you know, it's it's everybody's different. They need different things to get it. And uh, my sponsor told me that all I could do is be an example. You know, you keep going to meetings. You do what you're supposed to do. People are going to see that, um, you know, um, you walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, and, and the program will lead you in the right direction. Um, I was also taught that two steps forward and one step back is still progress. We practice progress, not perfection. Um, and, and that helps me because I fall short every day. Um, I make mistakes all the time. And, you know, I, I can I can get back up today and, and start over. I can start my day over any time I want to now. Um, instead of beating myself up all day or, or letting that ruin everything for me. Um, I don't really have anything else to say, Glenn, if that's okay. Um, I'm really happy um, to be here. I'm, I'm happy that y'all allowed me to share my story. 
um, I feel like it's been a little bit different sharing it on Zoom than what I do when I'm in person. Uh, it's just different, but, you know, I'm glad that we have the technology we have to keep us together when we can't be together. You know, I, I, I don't know that um, a lot of us would have made it if we didn't have um, these Zoom meetings and stuff over the last couple of years with the quarantines and all the rules of staying put or whatever. So but I'm grateful to be here um, and I'm grateful for uh, another day in sobriety.